Welcome back to Cinema Bucket List, the show where we work our way through the 1001 movies you must see before you die, a growing list of 1,245 must-watch films for all cinephiles. As always, I am Mike, returning with 12 more films from the list. The first time I watched David Lynch's feature film debut, I was not a fan. Not that I don't admire the artistry, I personally just prefer films with clear-cut stories and themes, and I still feel that way for the most part. However, upon my second viewing of Eraserhead for this series, I began to appreciate it more and saw it wasn't quite as ambiguous as the director would have you believe. Underneath the chaotic imagery and the gritty setting, it's a rather simple story of a man terrified of being a father and raising a child in a hellish environment when that child is alien to him as well. The film plays as Lynch working through his trauma of raising a family in a particularly dangerous part of Philadelphia. Don't worry, the neighborhood he lived in is quite nice now. My sister used to live there. Anyway. I see this film now not as a random collection of fever dreams, but rather a truly personal reflection of his mindset during a particularly vulnerable part of his life. And even while editing this video, I began to appreciate the comedic elements of it that I had not noticed the first time watching. While I still don't love it, I believe it is culturally and artistically significant enough to keep on the list. Continuing our journey into the 1001 movies, I've started noticing a trend of films made behind the Iron Curtain only to be released decades later. These films are fascinating to see, as by our standards today in the US, they're relatively tame in their criticisms of their government. Though we all know how soft the ego of Soviet officials were, so it's not surprising that a film merely about a government official who is paranoid about being surveilled by his colleagues was banned for 20 years before Czechoslovakia left the Soviet Union. This film reminded me of the best parts of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Those of you who watched the episode that that film was featured in know I didn't care for it, but I enjoyed this. It combines the intensity of a paranoid thriller with the character work of a domestic drama much like Virginia Woolf, creating an uneasy sense of doom as you wait for the worst to happen. The writing and acting are fantastic, and the shot choices make this suspenseful film more thrilling, even more thrilling than I anticipated. This is the kind of unique film I expect from this list. I will never understand the infatuation people had with John Wayne. With the exception of True Grit, he has never had a good performance. I guess he was too busy calling Native Americans selfish for trying to keep their land and going after people who happened to hold the opinion that communism could work under the right circumstances, and he was so busy he couldn't be bothered to take acting lessons. His character is so utterly pointless in this film that it's distracting. He's just a MacGuffin of a man. If they took his character's important plot points and gave them to literally any other character, the film would be stronger for it. On the other hand, James Stewart is fantastic, as usual, and his character's struggle with the morality of using violence in extreme circumstances is easily the best part of this film. Of course, Lee Marvin as Liberty Valance is an insanely good villain as well, but every time John Wayne was on screen, the film came to a screeching halt. I'd remove this and replace it with the assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford. It's a mouthful of a title, I know. With breathtaking cinematography by Roger Deakins, an incredible score by Nick Cave and Warren Ellis, and great performances from everyone involved, Andrew Dominic's 2007 biopic Western was one of the handful of films to redefine the Western in the modern era. It also handles the theme of the morality of using violence in extreme circumstances in a much more graceful manner. You should check it out. All right, dude. This time, right between the eyes. With classic films, you begin to expect an extremely watered-down version of violence. All killings are expected to happen off screen. That certainly isn't always the case, but it feels that way. So much so that the level of violence in this James Cagney-led film, while not bloody, is still shocking. When compared to similar films from this era, the character Cagney plays in this is so vicious, it's enough to make your blood boil. And the police procedural aspect of the film shines a light on interesting techniques police may have used back in the day. It's an interesting character study into the mind of a psychopath, realistic or not, and it kept my focus locked in. 
it stays on the list. Put that suit shoot on him. Me? Yeah, you. This don't look so hot, Cody. My way, there wouldn't be no shooting. Ain't gonna be any my way either. We're going out of here in a car like gentlemen, a picnic. They want me to take a little trip. Well, we're going to take a little trip. Only it better be a quiet one. Winning the Academy Award for the Best Adapted Screenplay in 2012, The Descendants explores the complexity of a man discovering his wife's infidelities while she's in a coma. Straddling the line of anger and sadness, George Clooney delivers an incredibly nuanced performance in the lead role. With a mixture of emotion and humor that director Alex Payne is known for, it's a film that truly deserves all the praise it receives. Not to mention, the Dean from Community is one of the writers who won an Oscar. It stays on the list. Elizabeth is dying. Oh, wait, fuck you. And she's dying. We unhooked her from the machines this morning. She'll be dead in a few days. This is him? Mm. It's fitting that this trilogy came up in September. After all, Bilbo and Frodo's birthdays is September 22nd. As is mine. What's it like sharing a birthday with fictional characters who are beloved throughout the world, you ask? Well, you see a lot of friends wishing them a happy birthday while ignoring you, but I'm not bitter or anything. You don't have any friends. It's obvious that this series is so iconic and possibly the best trilogy of all time, at least in consistency. These films were all a major part of the holiday season in the United States from 2001 to 2003. Everyone I know spent at least one outing over winter break to go see these films. I personally saw each one at least three times in theaters. It's a story about community and working together for the betterment of the world, despite our differences. You have my sword. And you have my bow. And my axe. And with great performances, beautiful cinematography, incredible battle sequences and special effects, and a killer soundtrack, this trilogy, which I personally consider as one film, is a masterclass in filmmaking from Peter Jackson. Much like Peter Jackson has said recently, I wish I could forget these films and watch them all over again with fresh eyes. All three of them stay on my list. Come on, Mr. Frodo. I can't carry it for you. But I can carry you. Come on! With this being the first film from Federico Fellini that I have seen, I went into this completely blind with zero expectations. And in doing so, was greeted with a bright and colorful film with a quirky sense of mysticism, adding a non-threatening paranormal element to the film about a woman reclaiming her sexuality and independence after discovering her husband's infidelity was not something I expected from a film made in the 60s. Films like this really make you realize how prude the US was back in the day, and in some regions still are, all told in an artistically compelling way. While I'm not in love with this film, it made me excited to watch more films from Fellini. It stays on the list. Il suono da emettere in amore per procurare piacere sono il suono in il grande sospiro da il suono put put il suono pat this was a surprising movie to come from the 50s. A pro-union historical drama starring primarily Hispanic actors and characters. Of course, I'm not surprised films like this are typically buried or just fall by the wayside, but I'm glad that they've been made and have been preserved. It shows another side of US culture that I'm sure many in the world are unaware of. This powerful film depicts the true story of a community of miners and their families banding together to fight for better treatment, and is inspiring and beautifully told using a combination of professional actors and non-professional actors. Many of the film's cast and crew were people who were blacklisted for having communist ties, and people fought against this film throughout the production, with some even going so far as to shoot rifles at the set. Lead actress Rosara Revueltas was even deported to Mexico for her involvement with the film. It's safe to say it's a miracle this film even exists. The history of the production alone makes it worthy of the list, but it's a solid film to boot. We give up now. If we obey this rotten cat hardly, we are fools and cowards. There is only one way. Fight them. Fight them all. Come on. We don't gain nothing. They'll arrest us. I used to think I loved westerns, but the more classic westerns I see, the more I realize I only love modern westerns. The ones that show the depravity and consequences of violence and condemn the wild west, rather than following a bunch of gun-loving virgins chasing and killing each other over a stupid rifle like this movie. 
Now I could watch a film about a few people fighting over an object. Hell, I love Pee-wee's Big Adventure. No, you are, but what am I? No, you are, but what am I? I know you are, but what am I? Infinity! But this film is repetitive and boring. The acting is decent and the cinematography is great, but there was not a single moment in the film where I could understand where someone thought it was an interesting enough story to write a whole script. James Stewart, I love you, but you're 0 for 2 in this episode. I remove it and replace it with the proposition. Taking place in Australia, this film already takes an intriguing twist on the genre with that aspect alone. But it is also an intense thriller that begs the question, how far would you go to save your brother? With brilliant performances and a great script written by Nick Cave, it's a fantastic film you should check out. Come on, oh, no! There's something oh, I can do for you, ma'am. Stranger in town? That's right. But I was talking to the lady. Yeah. It's kind of depressing watching this film. It follows German soldiers in World War I and was released before Hitler's rise to power and of course World War II as well. It's an American made film, but the entire premise is how easily young people are coerced into fighting for their country in a cause they're not entirely sure about. The manipulation and bullying you see thrown at the students by their elders who had not experienced even a percentage of the horrors that were the new age warfare that took place in World War I is disgusting and honestly something that needs to be gone from this world entirely. And it's heartbreaking to see how enthusiastically these kids joined, only to lose that enthusiasm immediately as they face the harsh reality of the trenches. This is a brilliant film with top-notch acting, writing, cinematography, and effects for the time. And it has an anti-war message that unfortunately still needs to be heard. It stays on the list. You still think it's beautiful and sweet to die for your country, don't you? We used to think you knew. The first bombardment taught us better. It's dirty and painful to die for your country. When it comes to dying for your country, it's better not to die at all. And that does it for episode 9 of Cinema Bucket List. My favorite film from this episode was the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Have you started working your way through the list? How many have you seen? What did you think of the films featured in this video and what was your favorite? Comment down below to share your thoughts and if you feel so inclined, feel free to like and subscribe. As always, I am Mike and I will be back next month with at least 10 more films from the 1001 movies you must see before you die. See you then.